Welcome to the Ashraf Garda Show. Kundal Panak, welcome to the to the Ashraf Garda Show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank now, you, I thought, you know, I, I need to pick up on a conversation that you had at an event um, that you moderated, facilitated a few days ago around um, unconscious bias, um, and, and I want to spend some time talking about that. But but firstly, let's start with with where you were, because when I last spoke to you, you were you were involved in in think auditing. So tell me where you were and, and where you are now. Yeah, I used to be the CEO of the Institute of Internal Auditors here in South Africa, and that's when I met you. Um, I left last year and found my own business, so and that's Brave Inflections, and specifically focusing in the area of leadership, um, culture, ethics, um, creating ethical um, organizations, so creating ethical cultures. And I do that in the context of other strategic advice, um, um, facilitation, um, coaching, executive coaching, running al alongside the leaders, um, who, especially those who are at inflection points, and um, doing some a bit of whistleblower support as well. It's a lot of organisations tend to neglect that um, that area. And um, keynote speaking, and I do that um, these days. It's mostly um, online. Uh, as, as, as we all, as we all know, yeah. All right. So let's talk about. Let's pick up from your company name, Brave Inflections. I mean, the uh, the issue of, of unconscious bias is is, a, is certainly one of those Brave Inflections that we need to uh, dig deeper into, right? What does it mean? Just as an opening line, brave, uh, unconscious bias means what? Right, so let me first start with saying uh, using the analogy of an iceberg. Uh, so if you if you think about your 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 mind, um, the conscious mind would be the tip of the iceberg. The the subconscious sits under the waterline, you know. So we we tend to not be aware, but that is where our belief system sits, um, where um, learned stereotypes sit, um, where our feelings sit, our emotions sit, and so essentially when we're talking about um, Unconscious bias, it's, it's those Im implicit reactions that come from your aware what that those, that those learned st stereotypes are affecting your behavior. And, and I suppose so, in, in, in the South African and the global context, I mean, the, uh, the issues of unconscious bias around racism, sexism, uh, othering other people, maybe, and, and religion, um, you know, gender issues. I mean, and that's the, that's the most pronounced issues what one should talk about when we talk about unconscious bias, right? They are, but the, but the other, um, so when we talk about unconscious bias, it also has almost, you can almost um, unpack it in terms of different types of unconscious bias. Um, and you can have different types of unconscious bias playing out at the same time. And so, for example, confirmation bias is um, when, you, when you take in a position, so even if it's sitting at a subconscious level, you start to look for things that confirm your position. And where we are now with this um, COVID-19 pandemic is a perfect example. You know, so I'm watching people in terms of how they're responding. And you can see those people who have taken a position in terms of this is a really, really bad situation and lots of people are going to die and, and they, they've mm -hmm. just taken the worst position. And then on the other hand, you've got denialists. And you can see how they're cherry-picking the information that's coming out because right at the beginning we had very little information about the virus but as research is being done and more um, information comes through people tend to still hold on <laughs> to their original positions because then they as i said they cherry pick and, and, and choose mm -hmm. um, what news would, would fit in another type of unconscious bias is affinity bias and, and that essentially is I, I tend to gravitate towards people who um, are similar to me. And a good example, uh, in currently now in, in the South African context, is that you know the stories around the farm murders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and you, you have certain lobbyist groups that are pushing that farm, that white farmers in particular in South Africa are an endangered species, you know, so and, and lots of emphasis on it. And then you start to see how people are responding to those stories. And you say, very good white people 
um, who would never see themselves as racist, suddenly piggybacking onto that story and that's all they're focusing on. So becoming blind to the fact that an actual fact in South Africa, when you look at the statistics, um, black people are at much greater risk of being murdered than white people. But your, 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 your ability to, um, that affinity bias that comes in, you, you, you only see, in, you gravitate to your own grouping, you only see what is in your own grouping. You know, so, and then the gender bias, mm -hmm. of course, um, which is the one, so the racism and, 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 and or the race um, bias and gender bias are the ones that we focus on most, you know. So, um, an example would be, um, uh, that immediately comes to mind a few years ago, I was sitting with a 16 year old um, and somebody was fairly close to me and she asked me um, what I wanted to be when I was growing up, you know, so I was told and I said, mm -hmm. said look, when I got to matric, I wanted to become an architect and the first response was an architect, Auntie Claudel, <laughs> but that's a man's job. Yeah. And I, I was, I really, I was floored because we now hear, um, this is not 50 years ago, and a child who is that close to me, um, so this is now a girl having, you can see that that bias is in the subconscious of even the women. So women themselves. Um, also have bought into that lie that society is. So you, you find that there are different kinds of um, unconscious mm -hmm. bias um, that um, we definitely live I, with every day. I suppose, I mean, you know, I, I'm going to assume that, that all these biases are wrong, uh, but, but perhaps the, the, the more important issue that we should be talking about then, to, to what extent are these unconscious biases, and you've given us some very good examples, to, to what extent does it, does it harm society? Oh, to a great extent. Yeah. So if one were to, to look at um, so race-related unconscious, mm -hmm. uh, unconscious bias, um, eventually what it does is it stops people from progressing. So it's, it's and, and the same would be for gender. So well then what we find, if you look at the South African context, for example, you, you, we still have a significant problem in our top leadership layers. Um, where the numbers are skewed and a significant part of that contributing uh, factor is that those who are the gatekeepers um, are also the people who are blocking and those same people amongst those people they are those who are race uh, um, blatantly racist and I think we need to be clear about uh, the difference between the two right so they are those who actually they know they believe that black people are inferior, mm -hmm. racist, right? And then there is the stereotyping that may be sitting underlying and you don't realize that it is actually driving your behavior. Um, so you, you, you have those two groupings, but then the, the door gets shut. So you, you don't get the transformation that needs to come through in society. But very importantly, a number of studies have shown that the victims of... Um, bias actually not just end up suffering from mental health issues but it affects their bodies as well so typically what happens is you have your um, the hormone called cortisol is was is really put in our bodies to help us um, when we're in danger mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so you get that surge so every time you are in a situation where you perceive that you are um, being discriminated against. It creates an, an increase of cortisol within your system, which is okay when you're in danger and you need to run. It is not okay when it's there consistently in your system. So what it then does is trigger diseases in your body. So people suffering from high blood pressure and so forth. So there's a health consideration as well. All right, so, and, in, in once again the South African context, we've got a significant skill shortage. For us to drive the economy to where it needs to be in, uh, besides the current issues that we've got to deal mm -hmm. with, with corruption and so forth, is we need more skilled people. But if, we, if the gatekeepers are not opening those doors so people can 
learn and become competent and not just have a theoretical knowledge but be able to practice and then become competent we're going to remain in the same place because you, you, you can't mm. run the economy forward with the um, very few skills that we've got in the country so it, it has a ripple effect a significant ripple effect uh, within and and affecting the health and the wealth of the country and the point you made about and i think we need to we need to touch on this one between you know con conscious bias and unconscious bias right so so conscious bias is, is someone who's very clear very overt about that's my position that's my that's my stance right um unconscious bias i mean do, do we obviously by its by its definition it says unaware right uh, how many people then would be would be yes. You know, are there statistics to say how many people are guilty of, of a form of unconscious bias every single day of their lives? Well, I don't think we have s statistics in terms of every single day of, our, of, of, of their lives, but certainly all of us are guilty. Um, so today, for example, because I'm working from home, uh, it's unlikely that I would practice unconscious bias. Um, who knows, maybe somewhere in our conversation I may, mm -hmm. <laughs> because I would have stereotypes when it comes to men, because I'm now talking to yeah. a man. But essentially, all of us have stereotyping ingrained in our system and in, in our subconscious, because as, as we've grown up, we, we have been told things as little, girl, as little girls, little boys, um, and we've taken those things in. Um, so when you, um, for example, as a, as, a, as a woman of color um, coming in, in contact with an older white man, um, I need to be very careful that I don't put that person in a box and say this is um, one of the oppressors mm. <laughs> from both my race and gender perspective. Uh, so my, my response to him may very well come from that place where that has been ingrained in me. Um, you know, and it's, a, it's, 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 about, it's about race, it's about gender, it's about age, it, it is about so many different things um, that I don't think there's any, not, not one single person on the face of the earth who can say that I do not have any biases or stereotyping that sits underneath the waterline that drives that, uh, that don't, don't drive So, so a person like the American President Donald Trump, when, when he talks about the China virus, uh, is that a form of unconscious bias or is that a form of, of very overt, deliberate, I'm assuming you know what goes on in his mind, okay? What other two would that be? Well, if, if I think when, when one looks at somebody like a, a Donald Trump, um, you can't just take one statement and make the assumption um, that it's conscious or unconscious bias. But you kind of look at the trend. So if I look over a period of time, um, I think that he has said enough things to confirm that it is not covert, that it is overt, that he knows exactly what he's saying and he, and he knows why he's saying what he's saying. Um, and he, he, he plays to different constituencies, so no, I don't think that's unconscious. Bias. So if I, if I look at your example, then the one you gave me earlier about, about being with this white male colleague and, and immediately you de develop negative senses towards this person because of historical facts about that, that the majority of people who oppressed the majority of the rest were, were, were white South Africans, right? Um, so if you thought like that before you even engaged that person, only because he's, he's a male and because he's white, um, you obviously are practicing unconscious bias, but would that then be constituted as racism as well from your side? You may be being a, a victim of racism, but now effectively uh, perpetrating a form of a milder form of racism, but, but it still would be racism. I think we need, we need to distinguish between stereotyping and racism. Uh, so racism essentially is saying um, contributing different attributes to another person because based on their race. But the key issue here is about superiority and inferiority and, um, and oppression and behaviors that um, discriminate against that individual, right? So if I look at a white male 
and assume that that person is looking at the area. That is not um, racism. It is stereotyping because it is there is no behavior that would say that I am superior to this person. My actions, I can discriminate against this person. Um, and racism, it's it's it's. One needs to be clear about that distinction in terms of the superiority, inferiority, and the oppression, and that your actions actually can take something away from that individual. Mm. I hope that makes well, sense. Well, it certainly does. How? I mean, it does get me thinking about this. So how harmful is unconscious bias to, to humanity? Whether we're talking South Africa, whether you're talking about Korea, China, the USA, the Middle East, how harmful is that in practical terms in whichever form unconscious bias plays out? I think it's, it's, it's harmful um, for everybody, right? So because on the one hand, we, what we're doing is we, we're robbing humanity from um, operating at, at optimal level. Right? So if, if I don't give you an opportunity because I don't realize that I'm, I'm blocking and I'm, I'm closing the door on you, I don't know whether you may have the answers to the questions or the struggles that I'm dealing with. Right? So it stops that flow of learning and, and inf information that helps us to evolve, to propel forward as humanity. But as I mentioned earlier on, it, it, it also has a significant um, impact on um, people's mental health, your own ability to move forward. So I'll give you an example. Um, I was already in my 40s when I, for the first time, had to confront within myself um, what apartheid had done to me in terms of how I viewed me. Um, and then it was uh, started with my co coach that I was uh, dealing with, and she's asked me to make a list of um, things that I like about myself and a list of things I don't like about myself. Uh, so, and I thought, I got it. I am very self aware. I was very proud of my homework when I put the homework in front of her. And um, she, she looked at it and she asked me, Why don't you have? have on here, uh, when, on your list of the mm -hmm. things that you like about yourself, that you are beautiful. I couldn't, I was like, what, what, is, what is your problem? Uh, I'm not me. And I said to her, it was never, over the years, it was never something, I never considered myself beautiful, um, but it was never something that I dwelt on. And remember where the penny dropped. Um, I'd taken a friend to the Apartheid Museum, couldn't go through the whole, I probably caught away and I walked out because uh, I just became so emotional and I suppose all that stuff, it's sitting in the subconscious, you know, when you're mm. confronted with the images, it just comes back to your conscious mind. And I was sitting outside by myself and as I was reflecting on that, then I went, aha. I grew up in a world where my skin color was not considered beautiful. My features were not considered beautiful. Um, and therefore, I'd classified in my own mind that I'm not beautiful. And I said, but why is that important? The reason why it is important is that is a belief that was dropped into my head. I didn't create the belief myself. Yeah. So you can imagine, I'm, I'm sitting in my 40s and I'm going, oh, <laughs> I am broken. Mm -hmm. so, so in effect, you know, in, in so effect that, that you were then practicing, so having been a victim of unconscious bias, you then were, were practicing unconscious, a form of unconscious bias against your own self, right? Exactly. And that is, that is the point I'm trying to make. So, so many people are walking around a diminished version of themselves. Because if a whole system gives you that message all the time, you believe it. Uh, you know, you, you, especially when it's there from childhood and we don't realize to what degree we absorb that into our, into our subconscious mind. And we start believing it without 
consciously thinking that we're believing it. And we do, we do become diminished versions. So you can think about it in terms of humanity. Um, how many people are walking around a diminished version of themselves because they're exposed to bias all the time? And, and, and therefore, I mean, can, can we put a cost to it, to, to, well, maybe yours as an individual, but then collectively as a, as a nation? Correct. And, 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 you would, and you would take that into, because we now talked about it from a race perspective, but there's the gender perspective as well. Um, I am often amazed at how many women have settled into the role of diminished. You know, so you come, a smart woman that's a significant society. And they believe that women are lesser. Okay, wow. How, how then do we untrain that philosophy? So let me give you an example. Um, so many years ago, I was standing in front of a number of pastors, about 30 odd. I was asked to come and talk to them about this new Skills Development Act and Employment e Equity Act um, that's come that was uh, come through as legislation from government. I was the HR manager at the time. So as I was busy explaining to them what would be required of the organisation, um, and. It, I must also state that of all of them, about 95% of them were white men. No, but this does not apply to us because um, God calls people. And of course, my mouth tends to be too fast sometimes and I immediately chirped. In that case, God is a sexist and a racist. Mm -hmm. um, but the essential, the issue is, if you look at the numbers in front of you, they tell you something. If the organization has not yet transformed, the numbers are clear. So the leadership needs to show that it is taking it seriously and looking at where that unconscious bias is creeping in. Because sometimes, you know, those gatekeepers, the people who are recruiting, um, are looking affinity bias, right? So look, they're looking for people who are like them mm, mm. because they believe that they would be um, better for the organization and not necessarily for diversity. They need to look at the policies, whether the policies are um, hindering um, uh, the organization from tra transforming. But just in terms of transformation as well, I think it's important is not about the numbers, mm -hmm. but that there are conversations in the organization to ascertain whether there is real transformation. Does a Cladell, as a female director, when she walks into the boardroom, does she feel that she's accepted as an equal, that her voice is heard? Now, I know the feeling of, you know, you... you you speak, I'm generally, I'm used to generally when I speak, people listen, huh? but I've also learned what it feels like to speak into a black hole where people just shut off and they're not hearing you because they have already formed opinions and they have already that subconscious bias uh, that comes in. So I think it's, it's important that leaders look at these things. How, tell me about the black hole. I mean, can you share the experience? I mean, so how, how do you know that they were not listening to you because of, of an unconscious bias or they were not listening to you because actually you, you were just a boring speaker, right? Uh, how, how do you know which one it was? Well, I think um, it depends on, uh, for me it was about what it is that I'm putting on the table. And you would often hear women say this. Um, they would raise an issue put an idea on the table um, and it just nobody listens and then later on a male counterpart would put the same idea on the table and suddenly people hear it and I've, I've seen that happen a lot of times I have also seen I've been in situations where um, I've been fortunate that there was a male in the room that did hear and then re-articulated did you all see it mm -hmm. But it's, 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 it's not so much about whether you are boring in how you're presenting it, it's about whether your ideas are heard. 
Um, and I've, I've seen that over and over again, you know, the, the assumption. I've been in situations where I've gone to meetings with my staff um, so you would have, say, you go with your your uh, manager who is white male, and um, throughout the meeting you completely ignored. You can see the conversation mm. is directed at him. Um, they're making eye contact with him. It's like you're invisible, um, and it's it's and it's a weird feeling. Uh, you know, growing up mm -hmm. in the household that I grew up in, we were all girls, and Daddy was a feminist, so I didn't experience that. And um, later on, when you then open your mouth with a decision, then they realize who, ac who actually is the boss in the room. Um, but that has happened a number of times to me, and I've, I've seen that happen to a lot. Well, a lot of women have, okay. have uh, articulated exactly the same And how, how did you feel about it when you, when you were first aware of what was going on in front of you, that you were not being heard, not because you were boring, actually they haven't even heard you, but they've already decided that this person doesn't know enough and always not been worthy of, of being heard. How did you personally feel about that? It is, it is, it, it's, I, I suppose that the first reaction that I would feel or what I felt was anger. Now for me, anger is only an expression of pain. You know, so I, I bring it back to, okay, you're angry. What is the pain that you're feeling? And it's, it's painful as a human being especially when you know that what you've put on the table is really valuable. You know, so I don't think I'm the sharpest pencil in the room, but I also know that I'm not stupid. You know, so when I put something on the table, I know that there's something, there's something of value in there. So the pain is twofold. The one is the realization that you are being treated as less. That, that is painful. But then also, um, I think for me, and that I suppose it also is um, to do with my personality type. For me, is when I know that idea, if that is not going to be affecting people's lives, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you when you, you can see the ripple effect, and you you're starting to this invisible um, ghost, you know, because you you you. You're trying to, to get people to see that if X is not going to happen, that, that the ripple is going to be that there are going to be a lot of people whose professional lives may be affected or whatever it may be. Um, the first few times I would say that that, when I realized it, wasn't in South Africa. Okay. Um, it's, and, it, and I think maybe Part of it is because of the circles that I have found myself in in South Africa. Um, the first time that I really felt invisible was um, in a different country. And um, I was like, what? These people are not seeing me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, did, did, did it's it, bizarre. Did, but did, did it hurt you? Yes. It was very painful. It, it took time for me to... I think I am fortunate in that I had a daddy who raised me to believe that I am I am human, I am equal. Um, so what I needed to do for myself is you, you get the anger, but then you realize, okay, um, I'm angry because I'm feeling pain. Why? Where is the pain coming from? How am I going to deal with this? You've got you, you've got two options. Either you're going to absorb it and you're going to pull back mm -hmm. and you're going to, okay, I am invisible and you then become invisible for yourself as well. Or you make the decision, the problem is not me, the problem is with them. And that I think is very, very important. Um, I've seen lots of women or people generally um, lose their voice because it shakes their, um, their sense of self and they become insecure. And in my coaching, um, dealing with clients, it's one of the things that I often, de that I often see, the deep-seated insecurity as a result of having lived through those 
kind of experiences. Mm. Do you, I mean, do you find... And it's, it's tough to... Yeah. Do, do, do you find that for people, and it, and it could be issues about color, race, religion, uh, gender, but many other issues as well, do you find that for people on their own, because they're victims, and that's how they are conditioned, uh, they put themselves in a packing order. So, so they decide up front, you know, Claudel's less than me, I'm better than her, or in fact, I'm lesser than her, she's better than me. Um, and, and that plays out in all sorts of decision making that takes place. Absolutely. I, I don't think that it is always, it's a conscious decision. Um, I think that in a lot of cases, people don't even realize what is happening in their subconscious and that that pecking order does um, uh, take place. It happens in their minds without necessarily thinking clearly through it. Because if you think through it rationally um, and you're then able to see what is at play and you're able to respond appropriately, but more often than not, we react. Because remember, touch is emotions mm -hmm. that's sitting under that waterline. So how, how does one... And, and, and here's the other thing is, can, can a person who's guilty of, of unconscious bias, can that person be charged constitutionally, say, in South Africa and other parts of the world? I think it depends that the... Um, in terms of charged, it's, it's about the behavioral patterns that play out. Right, so... Um, as I said, all of us walk around with unconscious bias, but it is, what is it that we do, that action? And I think that often when it, when it is a, um, the kind of behavioral, um, the action that comes through that would um, cause harm, that you would now start to talk about charging the person, I would have doubts about whether we're still talking about unconscious bias. Okay, so something more would have played out, and, and unconscious bias would have been yes. the trigger for, for that, right? What about, I mean, we, we speak to you now in the midst of, of Women's Month and Women's Day coming up in South Africa once again. Uh, so, so you've touched on your personal example, and yet you're not typical. You see, I'm, I'm presenting a bias here because you're, you're very much a business leader in your own right, okay? But by and large, to what degree does unconscious bias play out where, where women are, are, are therefore shortchanged virtually at every transaction or intersection where, where people connect? Yeah, and, 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 and let me... Also, be clear in that I don't think uh, I think we need to be clear that it's it doesn't always just come from men. Mm. Um, sometimes it comes from women as well. As I said earlier on, a lot of women have bought into this thing of um, women are inferior to men. Um, and, so, and, and it plays out in in so many different spaces. Where let me give you an example. Um, talking about business women and high profile women, um, a lot of them experience that they, um, they may be married to a good guy, um, really good guy, but who supports them. Um, I want you to have a career. But when they get home, what plays out at home negates that. Right, so both of them may have had a very busy day, come back home, the guy then expects the woman to then run the household as well. Right, so, and he's living out the, um, what he has learned, the role of the woman, and doesn't stop to think, what impact does it have on her? So, and this is one of the reasons why men can often run faster than women. So if, if she still has to get home and run the household, household, deal with the kids and so forth, in that time, what is he busy doing? He can do extra work. He can get extra in. He can read. Um, so the time in terms of the, the two have for their own development is not the same. So ask that guy, does he think he's a sexist? Hell no. <laughs> But um, let's have a conversation about what is really playing out here. Yeah. Right? Um, and I think a, a lot of women are sitting with that, which, which is also hinders their progress. And because of, because of the way we've been socialized, 
women tend to then take that role on because we naturally we are nurturers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and we and we don't want to create conflict and you um, and you may even have the the mother-in-law reinforcing that role that you're supposed to play um, so they have has an impact on that things like um, the the policies that women find in their organizations yeah um, if I'm pregnant I'm being discriminated mm -hmm. against I can't um, or you know and organizations not thinking long term about the value um, that I bring uh, the conversations that I often have with my my dance instructor Tony so I've been dancing um, ballroom in Latin American for about 22 23 years now um, so we every now and then Tony and I have this conversation about the partnership between the man and the woman and for me it aptly demonstrates what happens in society he says to me you know he loves dancing with me because I carry my own weight um, you know and a lot of the female students that he has um, expect him to carry them and what it does is it creates an imbalanced partnership so these women have been conditioned that I am not strong, he is stronger. So what I found with me, the two of us can go ballistic on the dance floor uh, because that I can take it. But they, we've also developed the kind of relationship where I lead sometimes. If I think about something, I go for it. And because most women don't think like that. We have this lopsided power, imbalance in power in society. All right, so, so, I mean, education is critical, and I'm thinking there's two parts of education. One would be the formal education that takes place in, uh, in schools or universities or, or other institutions, and then also at, at, in the workplace. But, but the other education, the starting point, would probably be in, in, in the homes. Now, as I asked that question, there's a whole lot of cultural uh, norms and nuances what one can talk about so so what is your advice I mean how, how do we educate people to to be not uh, to not to be biased unconsciously unconsciously sorry yeah. yeah look I think it's 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 about the awareness and that comes through more and more conversations um, but I think critical to the conversations is let us talk about empathy the reason why somebody can do something from an unconscious bias perspective that may hurt me is their inability to put themselves in my shoes so you who are not listening to me how would you have felt if that had happened to you and then let's see if you take it further you're dealing with a fellow human being so confronting that lack of empathy that we have, you know, so if you look at um, what plays out in the households, what we're expecting from mothers, um, there is a lack of empathy. So the more we, we talk about unconscious bias, the more we talk about how it plays out, the more we talk about how it hurts people. What does it do to people? So that we can increase the empathy, I think we will have, um, we can start to see the ships. Because mm. we, we, we rather than play, play on the, the, the fact that people want, generally speaking, and I'm now excluding the psychopaths, right? Um, but generally speaking, people want to be good people. So if I say to Ashraf, when you are dealing with Cladell, you will inflict pain if these behaviors play out. It will stop Ashraf in his tracks a little bit and make him think. And the more and more he becomes conscious of it, the more and more we can shift behaviors. Okay. Um, if we're talking about schools, and I think, um, you know, I was, I was watching a um, John Oliver, I think it's his latest um, program where he's talking about history in America okay. and how history is being taught. Um, I think that with all the significant gaps in the history, what we're doing is we are creating space for those unconscious biases to develop at a very young age. 
And so let me take a, a very very current example. Um, there's a mm. lot of focus on the corruption in South Africa, and there is um, a lot of people who don't say it. Many people believe the corruption is a black thing. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we have a black government. But that is because stuff that happened pre four were hidden. So if I I'm a white person and aware of um, the corruption that happened in the apartheid years and I only see the corruption now, what is going to happen? I'm going to associate mm. corruption with race instead of it is a human issue, it is everywhere um, and in sometimes it is so covert that we become blinded to it. Right? And it's a the similar situation with if, um, as a white person to uneducated black people, it reinforces that bias that I have. Um, so you, we, we need to, to teach um, to what they've never been exposed to so that they can, mm -hmm. we can get that correction in the so mind. I, I think you raise such an important point because if you look at the South African dynamic, you know, I think it's a given, um, you know, whatever. 15% of the top, the richest people in the country are white. Uh, you know, eight, say 60% of the poorest people are, are black. So, um, and then I, you can say the same thing with education, lack of education. So it's very easy um, to, to be in a room and, and make that unconscious or conscious call that these are the rich people and these are not, and they would, and they would be split on color lines, right? So, I mean, two things you said there for the issue of, of Consciousness and, and, and empathy, right? Uh, so, how much how much time, therefore, do we need to spend on on increasing the a level of personal consciousness about about who we are, what we say, what we do, uh, and link to that this the sense of empathy to understand other people, no matter who they are. Now, how much time should we spend on that? Are we doing that as a society? Oh, we need to spend a lot more time that we, than we are. I don't think we have nearly enough time on it. I think we need to look at the different spaces where we need to spend on it. Um, and I think that leaders in all spheres um, need to think about their role of bringing the conversation forward in their areas of influence. So in the schools, at university level, um, the religious institutions across the board. Um, you know, you often find in religious institutions that there is a shying away from having these open conversations. And in some cases, so if you were to take um, Christianity, for example, yes, you have certain aspects in, uh, or certain denominations where it may be better and others not, where there is a very active um, preaching, conversation from the pulpit that says, women, you must submit yourself, you know, and, and, and we're not confronting the, the real issues um, in the right spaces. So, no, I think we, we really need to reflect, uh, have more conversations, but it is because we have allowed it to get to where it is now. So the problem is bad. It's just everywhere bad. But the more and more we improve, the less and less you would have to talk about it all the time because it would become part and parcel of how we think. But, but if we start to ingrain it in, in, in the thought processes of from kids uh, in school to, to, to teach them how to constantly reflect and, and, and um, uh, identify those areas where they may have bias. So I, mean, I would think, you know, if we're talking at an organization level, be it schools or universities or, or, or workplaces, uh, I mean, that should be happening. If it's not happening or if it is happening, it needs to be absolutely accelerated, right, as, as, as part of our consciousness. Yeah. But, but I think the bigger conversation needs to be happening at home. And I mean, as you've been speaking about a whole range of issues about uh, defined territories, I mean, I can think about myself and my wife, so perhaps I'm guilty of, of many of the things, sadly, that, you, that you've touched on, right? But, but the point is that... So that conversation at home, how important is that and, and what form should that conversation take? Yeah, it is, it's, 
yes, absolutely, I agree. And I mean, the conversation needs to take place at home as well. But often, and the reason why I mentioned the other spaces is because in places like home, those conversations don't often spontaneously happen. Um, and where you have an unequal relationship already, it becomes a lot more difficult to have that conversation. So it starts with mum and dad being able to have the conversation around what are the things that we where we need to shift our mind before we can start teaching our kids. Right? So the relationship and, and, and how we, um, we behave, how we interact with each other um, is an example to the children as well. Uh, so for the woman to be able to say, um, you know, in the last five years, very to you, I have not lived the fullest version of who I am. I've not been able to live my full potential because in our relationship, I am second. You know, it's, 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 and for the man to, uh, I'm thinking about, um, a number of years ago, I was having a conversation with a, a white male journalist, and um, he completely floored me. Somewhere along the line, we the conversation had gotten to you know the stereotyping and so forth, and he said to me, "Do you know what a burden it is to live with being told all your life that you must be the best because you're a white male?" Mm -hmm. And, and, and that shook me a bit because I'd never thought about it like that, you know. I'd, I'd always just assumed that white males have the sense of entitlement that they are at the top of the, of, of the mm -hmm. food chain. Mm -hmm. And here was a white male who was reflecting on what it was doing to him. Because now, every time he encounters somebody who is of a different race or a different... Um, uh, a different gender who maybe then he is in a particular area it hits his ego it hits his sense of self he's um, he how can you be number one if others are better than you so it puts a tremendous amount of, of burden so when I look at coming back to the household I've always been one of those women who could not understand why the man would want to carry that burden of hmm. being the leader, the everything. Why would you want that? Uh, <laughs> yeah. women, women tend to live longer. Um, I mean, it's starting to change now. But if I look at the kinds of things that men die of, and I ask myself the question, if you didn't put that pressure on yourself, would you have had a better quality of life? Mm -hmm. And the two of you, would you have had a better quality of life if neither of you were hurting because of this bias issue? Yeah, and the answer is yes. But that's a difficult conversation because you and, and and I think in some cultures even more than others, it depends on how um, you've been raised, right? So if you um, if you're a sexist, that's a a little more more of a difficult conversation than when there is just the stereotyping underlying unconscious bias that you've got mm. to deal with. What, what did you tell the the white journalist when he told you his story? How, how did you respond to him? Now, my response to him was, I'd never thought about it like this. I, I've, I'd actually never seen through your eyes. And I think that is, that is the, the issue of empathy, right? To be able to step back and, 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 and look through the lens that the other person is looking through and understanding that they're experiencing a different reality than the, your reality. Uh, most of us have this tendency of walking around thinking that everybody experienced reality the way we do. It's a very difficult thing to step back and say, okay, you, this is different for you. I didn't see that. But I did say, I said to him, I'd never, I couldn't, and I reflected a lot more um, after that. I wish I would have had the, uh, a conversation with him later after I'd had some time to reflect on it because... Nobody's ever said that to me before, mm. and and that stopped me in my tracks a little well, bit. Well, I suppose we're having it now, and, and that 
definition of empathy that you said, is, is that how you see it? To be able to take a step back and look through the lens of another person, that is a, is a graphic uh, description of, of, of showing empathy, yeah? Yes, and that's the, 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 the one element. And the other element is, I mean, as you're looking through their lens, your ability to um, transplant yourself in, into their shoes and ask yourself the question, if this was my reality, and this is what I experienced, how would this make me feel? At all times, yeah, it's a that, good one. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That changes everything. Just lastly, so, so we're in Women's Month, South Africa is Women's Day once a year, uh, 9th of August and then, and then the whole month of August is Women's Month. Does, does Women's Month and how Women's Month is set up, that, does it work towards shifting this issue of, of unconscious gender bias or not? Not nearly um, where it, what it needs to do. Um, you know, I actually, I was saying this on Monday that um, please don't treat Women's Month like Mother's Day. And I think that is, that is what's happened um, a lot, that um, people celebrate women, right? So, um, celebrate women like we do our mothers on Mother's Day or our dads on, on, on Father's Day. This should be... And I've always said this, I've, I've, I've always been against Women's Month. I would have wanted to say, let's call it Equality Month. Let, let's have a, a broader conversation around those issues that are hindering us from being a society where every human being experiences life, um, a high quality life, um, and is seen, they believe that they are treated as equals. Um, because if, if we just celebrate the women, then Women's Month is over and nothing changes. Um, I don't think that we've seen in a, a significant shifts year after year um, celebrating Women's Day and wo Women's Month. Um, it bothers me that I still articulate experiences that my grandmother experienced. Is it better now than it was then? Yeah, back my grandmother was a domestic worker. Um, I got to the point where I was CEO, you know, so she could never have achieved that. But yet at the same time, my stress levels, because of the discrimination and the constant battles that I've had to fight, may even have been worse than hers. Yeah? Um, because now... You, you, you've got to fight against the resistance of those who do not believe that you belong there. You don't belong amongst well, them. Well, they um, Yeah, we need to do a lot more, mm. Ashraf, a is, lot is it, more and have honest conversations. I think so. And, and hopefully people watching us and listening on, on podcasts or YouTube will internalize this conversation about what are they doing around unconscious bias uh, in, in their very own homes, right? Is there, is there, any, is there a final point uh, that, that you wish to bring to attention? Um, let me let me say this um, to people who feel that they are victims of discrimination as a result of, of bias. Don't give your power away. Yeah, reflect on to what degree you have absorbed what society has said about you being inferior. That is what you need to fight. You need to become whole. You can't stand next to somebody as an equal human being when you're broken. So whilst we encourage people to work on their um, unconscious bias where they may be hurting other people, I really want to encourage uh, those who are victims who are hurting to get over the victim mentality, to get over the learned helplessness and to work on becoming whole. Well, there you are, Claudia Alphonac. Thanks for your very brave inflections, and you certainly, I think, would be a catalyst for, for further thinking around this topic uh, and, and where we fit, where we see ourselves in society. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ashraf. Appreciate it.